The fifth idea that we're going to look at in order to analyze this, um, the, the, the shape of didactic pedagogy is this idea of proprietoriness. So the teacher comes into the classroom and it's their classroom. There aren't many connections with the outside world. There isn't much uh, um, supervision or analysis of what they do. The results come out at the end of the year. I suppose that's a measure of something. Every now and then an inspector would come to check that the classroom was okay and things were working all right. But essentially this was a very private bounded space. And um, now in terms of proprietoriness, the other thing is that every student was privately doing their work. So this image here, which amuses me, which is in fact a relatively recent image from a group of students taking a test in, in Thailand. It be, went viral on the internet and it's sort of, for me, it's not the image that matters, it's what the image means, which is the idea that, you know, my own work is my own work and I'm not gonna show it to other people because there's something very proprietorily mine about it. So the idea of collaborative work, joint work, um, is really not, uh, it's not part of the, the, not part of the didactic pedagogy model. The, the next point, the sixth point, is about the epistemological dimensions of these didactic uh, uh, classrooms. Um, and by epistemological, we mean what are the conditions of knowledge making? What's the theory of knowledge? What are the underlying assumptions about the nature of knowledge? So, what we have is we have facts in the world. Yeah, Mr. Gradgrind said that. We're gonna fill the kids with facts. Um, uh, um, and you're gonna learn those facts, you're gonna memorize those facts, and you're gonna have them right or wrong when it comes to the test. Or what we might have is we might have theorems. You know, mathematics is full of theorems, which is this is how a triangle is, this is how you enact a formula. And the theorems also produce correct answers. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna to learn to operationalize forms of thought that we're told and operationalize those forms of thought correctly. And what we have overarching uh, the whole thing is these things called subjects, which are history and mathematics and English language, whatever it is. So in other words, we have this kind of epistemological frame of reference where the way in which you learn a subject is by learning its facts and theorems and demonstrate that you're able to remember uh, those facts or correctly operationalize the theorems. What follows from this is a set of pedagogical assumptions. In a sense, we've seen pedagogy in all of the other dimensions as well, but I'm just bringing this really to a, a, a pedagogical head in a number of ways, which is what underlies the architectonics, what underlies the epistemology is actually a transmission theory of knowledge and learning. So the teacher in the textbook are gonna tell you things and you're gonna remember them. I've, they've got knowledge and they're gonna transmit it to you and you're gonna absorb it. Uh, the very, um, the famous and important uh, Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, called this a banking model of education. We're going to invest <laughs> you with knowledge um, and we're going to fill you up with knowledge in, as if we were depositing something in the bank. Um, uh, and what we have is the, the classical pedagogical means, the classical pedagogical media for um, were the syllabus, which really had a whole list of topics. You know, in grade four, you're going to learn the rivers and the mountains of your country, and then you're going to do the history of something or other, some revolution, some invasion, something or other. Um, and the syllabus laid out a series of contents. It didn't lay out processes. It didn't lay out capacities. It laid out the contents of the subject area. This changes later on when we get to some you know, authentic and transformative pedagogy. And then what the textbook writers did is they took all the stuff in the syllabus and chapter by chapter, they filled it out with content. So in other words, what they did is they summarized the world um, and, and presented that information into the classroom. They brought that into the information in the classroom in a summary form, chapter by chapter, slavishly following the syllabus, section by section. And then working alongside the textbook as the teacher who would give lectures on the same topic. The teacher presumably knew what was in the textbook, they had a broader knowledge about it, and they could stand at the front of the room and they could give lectures. And what happens at the end to check whether you've learnt what's been transmitted to you, you might do a test. My last dimension is what I call a moral dimension. Uh, or a phrase that I quite like is a moral economy. I don't mean moral in the sense of the opposite of immoral. I mean moral economy in the sense of what, are, what kind of an ethical framework, what kind of a set of assumptions about human social relationships uh, are created um, in these kinds of environments. Well, the first thing is, 
uh, that that you learn discipline. You know, you turn up at school on time, you behave yourself, you comply with the teacher's commands, you give the right answers to uh, uh, to questions, you um, show that you've remembered the facts, you demonstrate that you can operationalize theorems that have been presented to you. So one of the main lessons is not the content, because how relevant is knowing all the rivers, or in the case of Charles Darwin and um, Winston Churchill, what's the point of learning Latin declensions off by heart? Um, well, the point is actually a point about discipline, that you will do as you're told, you'll sit there, you'll behave yourself, and for young children, this becomes something which becomes a replication for the rest of their lives. When they go and work in a factory, or when they go and work in an office in a bureaucracy, they will be disciplined in the same way that they've learned to become disciplined at school, and who cares what you learned at school? The most important thing is to learn to be disciplined. So. What kind of social order does this imply? It implies a social order of compliance where most, most people will not be creative actors in their lives. Most people will not be active participators in their lives. Most people will go to work and be told what to do by a supervisor. Most people will go to the office and do whatever the memo says they need to do. And in fact, what this produces is a certain kind of citizen, a certain kind of worker, a certain kind of social subject. Um, so, you know, in a way, this becomes more important than the content of what's taught in schooling. But also what, what's interesting about this as a, a, the kind of the moral, the moral economy of this space is that, in fact, not many people make it to university. In fact, during the heyday of mass introduced education from the late 19th to the first half of the 20th century, most people didn't even make it to high school. Um, so. What it was about was about sifting and sorting people for a very, very unequal society. So in other words, if you came in and you were, came from an educated family, an affluent family, you were more likely to do well and you became one of the lucky few that were made it through to further education, higher education perhaps, and there were very few who did. So in a sense, what the system did by failing you, and most students, most of the time it did fail, um, and most of the time they didn't proceed to the higher levels of education, is it kind of told you it was your own fault. You hadn't done one in school, you know, you're off to get a job in a factory, off to get a job as a clerk in an office. Well, the reason why you're not something else, a doctor or a lawyer or something which earns a whole pile of money, is because of your school results, so blame yourself for that. So in a way, systemically, what, what we did um, in the heyday of didactic pedagogy in those times was to build a system which rationalised inequality. So this is a very, of course, a very broad thumbnail sketch of what's happening in social terms, but this is a kind of a, a rough characterisation of how these schools worked.